So the topic that I was asked to talk about is the topic of forgiveness. Um, and it's a really important topic because I think it's something that we probably all struggle with as humans. Um, and it's not just the forgiveness between you and another individual, you know, forgiving someone for hurting you, forgiving someone for wronging you, but also forgiveness between ourselves, you know, forgiving ourselves for things that we've done. And of course, the ultimate level of forgiveness, the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking forgiveness through repentance, through tawbah, um, for things that we may have done that we know that we have not only wronged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we have gone against the deen, but that we've wronged ourselves in the process of doing. And I think sometimes the difficulty, what stops us from seeking that forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what makes us question, you know, will I even be forgiven for what I've done? is that we put a lot of focus and a lot of our energy and a lot of our thought processes on what we've done. Rather than, so we focus more on that sin or on the transgression that we've committed rather than focusing more on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than any sin we could have committed, is greater than any wrong that we could have done, any transgression we could do. And the, the bab, abwab al rahmah the, the doors of rahmah, the do, doors of mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are always open to us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that, you know, if you come to me walking in a hadith Qudsi, if you come to me walking, I will come to you running. Right? So it, there's always that, that desire within us to go back to that fitra. There is that desire within us to go back to that purity that we're born with, that belief in la ilaha illallah, that oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that sense of ikhlas, of sincerity in our actions. But what stops us? The dunya, getting pulled and pushed and, and taken in many different directions. And one of probably the greatest wiles of shaitan, one of the greatest tricks of shaitan, is the trick of making us believe that our sin is too great to be forgiven and making us believe that we ourselves can't even forgive ourselves, that we're not worthy of forgiveness. Okay? And that's a huge downfall that so many people struggle with. But the reality is that like, when we look at each other, when we look at our brothers and sisters, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, the reality is that we all sin, but we don't all wear our sins in the same way. Some of us may wear our sins in a visible way, where it's, it's out there for people to judge and people to, to constantly talk about and to backbite about. Okay? And some of us may wear our sins in a very private way, where externally we may seem to all the eyes of the world that we're the best person out there, but internally we may be treating our families poorly. We may be doing unspeakable things that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has at least protected us by giving us satr or, or the covering to not expose our sins to the world. But that doesn't make us any less of sinners than those who may be sinning openly. And I think that's the first step in recognizing what is the process of forgiveness. The forgiveness that you seek from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the forgiveness that you need to seek from yourself, and the forgiveness that you need to seek from the people that you've wronged. So the first step is recognizing what it means when you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You know, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompass the most merciful, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so unmeasurable, unfathomable, that it is so much great, greater than the mercy of a mother to her child. You know, when we think of the way a mother is with her child, we think that's mercy. But that's nothing compared to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept 99 parts of mercy for himself, and only one part of mercy has descended onto the earth. So when we look around at people and we see someone, for instance, feeding someone who's homeless, or someone you know, being kind to an orphan, or a mother being so caring with her child, or a father, or so on and so forth, we recognize that's just one part of mercy as compared to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so if we think about that and we imagine that for a moment and we recognize what it really means when we say Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the most merciful, more than anything we can imagine. 
And part of the difficulty that we run across sometimes when we think to ourselves, like, I have sinned so much, and I have sinned so long, and I have done so many bad things, how can Allah forgive me? You know, I don't pray, I don't fast, I, I'm not good to my parents, I, I do this, I do that, I do that. You know, it's a lost cause. Why, why should I even try to seek forgiveness? When we try to comprehend the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, divine forgiveness, in the same way that we try to understand human forgiveness, we can't ever compare. Because human forgiveness, like let's say I have a friend and um, I'm always slapping this friend around. Like, you know, you know, initially I'm like joking around, slap, hey, <laughs> uh oh, you looked at each other. <laughs> so, you know, initially, you know, I slap around like, like, hey, buddy, kind of a thing, right? And little by little, the slaps get harder, you know, and then, <laughs> uh oh, now I'm getting concerned, okay? But you know, as, as the slaps increase in intensity, you know, the friend may be like, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. The friend will forgive, will forgive, will forgive, right? But human forgiveness has a limit. There's going to come a point when the slap gets really hard where the friend and slaps back and is like, that's it, you know, I don't forgive you anymore, just stop it, right? Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His forgiveness, it's immeasurable. His rahmah is immeasurable. So when someone sins and commits a sin and, and commits themselves to tawbah, to saying, please forgive me truly with sincerity, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His forgiveness and repents and says that this is something that I will not do again, yet slips and falls and commits the sin again. There's no need for despair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not ever despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if you've sinned, you've sinned, you've sinned, and you've sought forgiveness and you sin again, don't despair. Seek forgiveness again. Don't say that's it, you know, well, every time I quit smoking, I wind up going back anyway, so what's the point of quitting? Quit and then quit again and quit again and make the intention to keep quitting every time you quit and every time you go back. Because the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there and his doors are always open. As long as the one sin that is unforgivable, of course, the one sin that truly you must cleanse yourself from is the transgression or the sin of taking another God with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sin of shirk. Okay? And if you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pleading, begging for that mercy, that repentance sincerely out of your heart, and the sin is any other sin, not the transgression of shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you, of course. And what does it mean to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open-hearted with that true tawheed, that belief in la ilaha illallah? So many times we say to ourselves that, well, you know, shirk, nobody these days prays to idols, so there's, there's no shirk really. Nobody these days prays to um, four or five gods, for example, you know, in the Muslim community I'm talking about right now. Um, you know, so there's no shirk in the Muslim community. But shirk, as we understand it in terms of just praying to idols, is not the only type of shirk. Shirk can also exist in when we stand to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If what occupies our mind is not Allah, if what occupies our mind in those moments of prayer is um, the cute boy who sits next to us in math class, right? If what occupies our mind is what got posted on Facebook a little while ago, if what occupies our mind is the new, um, I don't know, DS, do you guys play DS? I don't know, PX30, whatever, <laughs> you know, the new Xbox the game that's coming out, like, then in a way, we are not giving ourselves only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that way, we may not be praying just to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're praying to not an idol as a statue, but the other type of idol worshipping. The stuff that occupies our mind and time with things that pull us away from sincerity, that pull us away from the true tawheed and the true belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one and only, of course. Now when we think of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, we think about and, and, and put this in context with that slapping example that we just talked about with the friend, right? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that from wudu to wudu, we're forgiven. From salah to salah, we're forgiven. From jum'ah to jum'ah, we're forgiven. From hajj to hajj, we're forgiven. Look at all of the opportunities for forgiveness, subhanAllah. You know, and, and it's just consistently. But what's so important, and this is the first step that we need to remember when we're seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also when we're going through that process of seeking forgiveness from someone that we've wronged, or forgiveness from ourselves as well, it is so important that we hold fast to our prayer. It's so important that we ensure that our prayer, that commandment, the one thing that separates the Muslim from the non-Muslim, 
is sound. It's something that we hold on to dearly, that we're not skipping our salah, that we're not missing uh, fajr, that we're not praying late, that we're not delaying our salah. Why? When we look at our salah as an appointment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an appointment to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now imagine again, you have that friend, we're going to go back to that scenario, okay, since it seems very relevant to some individuals here. Okay? <laughs> we'll go back to that example. So, you know, you're, you're, you've been bothering your friend, bothering your friend, your friend is fed up, your friend is like, I'm not going to forgive you anymore. You feel bad. You're just like, oh no, like I didn't mean to hurt my friend in that way. Then you tell your friend, you know what, let's meet for lunch. Okay? And your friend is like, okay, I'll meet you for lunch. Lun that lunch appointment comes, and you decide not to show up. You're like, oh, you know what, I'm busy. You know, I, I've got to go play my Xbox or my DS or whatever it is that you're playing these days. You know, I'm busy. I, I'm, I don't want to miss Zumba class. You know, I'm busy. I, I want to make sure that I catch Downtown Abbey or... I know what else. Uh, I, I don't even know the shows that are on <laughs> Little House on the Prairie, whatever, you know, whatever show happens to be on that that you guys are watching. And you decide to miss that lunch appointment with your friend because you had to do something else. Does that mean that you cared enough about the relationship with your friend? No. No, right? It means that you didn't care enough about the relationship with your friend to make that appointment. Now, let's say you call your friend you know, later and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry, I missed the lunch appointment, but you know, Zumba class was so good, I just had to be there. Let's do dinner. You know, I'll meet you for dinner. Dinner comes, and you decide, oh, you know what? Um, I don't know, Macy's is having a sale, and I really just have to go before they close because I need that really cute blazer or Forever 21 or <laughs> somewhere cool that you guys shop, <laughs> Aeropostale, I don't know. Um, and I just have to go buy that blazer before the, the store closes, so I'm going to skip dinner with my friend. And you skip the dinner appointment too. Again, at that point, your friend is going to realize you don't really care about making it up to me. You don't really care about my forgiveness. And when we sin or when we do a transgression that pulls us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and when in our heart we make the niyyah, the intention that we want to purify our actions, that we want to get closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's all good and well for us to say that. But what's most important is to take the actions. So we've got those appointments already scheduled in our planner. We already know we've got an appointment five times a day with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An appointment where we can sit and pour our heart out and really seek that forgiveness. If we're skipping those appointments or not paying enough attention to those appointments, then are we truly seeking forgiveness? Or is it something simply that's easy to say but not easy to act upon? So ensure that know that Rahmat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wasi'a, that it is greater than we can imagine, but also know that you have to do your part. I know something that I always mention whenever I'm on college campuses and, and talking to people is the difference between tawakkul in Islam and tawakkul. Okay? So there's two terms that sound very similar, tawakkul and tawakkul. Tawakkul is the idea that you do everything that you are commanded to do, that you commit and you strive and you work wholeheartedly towards something, but you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of all planners. The other word, so ta that's tawakkul. Tawakkul means you put up your arms in the air, you know, you sit home on your couch, you eat Doritos, you skip your salah, and you're just like, well, Allah's the best of all planners. You know, if I'm going to Jannah, I'm going to Jannah. If I'm not, I'm not. Okay? So as Muslims. How would you spell the second one? Like, how is that? Tawakkul yeah. has a shadda over the kaf. Tawakkul does not. So it's just difference in the um, the tashkil. And tawakkul would have an alif, alif after the well, tawakkul, whereas tawakkul has no alif after the one. Um, so with, with tawakkul, that's what we're commanded to do. And we look historically like at our examples in Islam, and we see the signs of tawakkul, and we understand the difference between tawakkul and tawakkul. So for example, we look at Sittina Hajar, the wife of Sayyidina Ibrahim, alayhi salam. When she was taken to the desert with the infant child in her arms, she, she walked behind Sayyidina Ibrahim السلام, and she asked him, why are you leaving us in the desert? And he didn't answer. And she asked him again, why are you leaving us in the desert? And he didn't answer. And then she asked the third time and said, is this a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And he answered in the affirmative and said, yes. And so she responded and said, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect us and he will provide for us. And then she entered the desert. And we know that Sayyidina Ibrahim السلام, left with sadness, with a heavy heart, but he knew that this was his test of tawheed, his test testing his attachments in this dunya to ensure that his heart was pure and that there was no shirk in his heart of loving anything more than he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And so he left his family there, his infant son and uh, Sittina Hajir, and he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would protect them. Now Sittina Hajir with her child in the desert, she could have just sat down next to the child and said, Oh Allah, please send us sustenance. Oh Allah, please protect us. But she didn't. She actually did what we replicate today when we go to Umrah, when we go to Hajj, which is called the Sa'i. And the Arabic word Sa'i means striving in English. And seven times, back and forth between two mountains, Safa and Marwa. Has anyone ever had the blessing to do Umrah, Aziyara, or, or Hajj? Little. When you were younger. Okay. Yeah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to take our Umrah together, inshallah, in the future. Um, so during that, when you go to Umrah, you realize Safa and Marwa are really far apart. And I remember my first Umrah, um, I had seen, you know, with the kids when they do the model Hajj in their school, they put like two like trash cans or something and they cover it with cloth and they put one right there and one right there and that's Safa and that's Marwa and they go seven times back and forth. So in my mind, I always thought like, oh, there's Safa and there's Marwa. Now when you go to visit uh, Mecca, you realize that they're really far apart. Like these are two mountains that are pretty far apart that you have to go several, seven times back and forth. And you imagine a mother who has an infant child, her child is crying on the floor, floor out of thirst on the ground of the desert. And she doesn't just sit down next to him and be like, oh no, what are we going to do? But seven times she ran back and forth from mountaintop to mountaintop. Now in her heart she knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of all protectors. In her heart she knew that Allah would provide for her and her son. But she still strove. She did the actions and seven times back and forth stood on the mountaintops looking for that water. And of course we know the water sprang from the earth, which is Mayit Zamzam, the well of Zamzam, which continues to run today. So subhanAllah, you see, so many times we think, well, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be, you know? And this is something I bring up in my marriage talks all the time, you know, where people will ask, well, how much should I do to try to get married? Do I look desperate if I'm really, you know? And, and that's where the tawakkul comes in, you know? Where you have to do what you're commanded to do. You know? And the same goes for seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are not doing your basic commandments, if you are not following what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked you to do, which is essentially to worship Him, which is essentially to honor what, the reason why you were created, the reason why you were put on this earth, which is to worship Him. And if you are not doing that bare minimum of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you have to ask yourself, how badly do you want it? How badly are you seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How badly do you want to be showered by His mercy? Because His mercy is there, but we have to take the action. You know, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could say, kun fayakun, and everything can be, be and it will be. But still, we have to take those action. When Siddhna Maryam, for example, anha, gave birth to Sayyidina Isa, alayhi salam. When he was just a baby, when she was still in, in, the, in the throes of labor, she was commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shake the trunk of the palm tree so that a date would fall and so that she could eat from it and she could feed the child from the date. Okay. Now, have any of you ever tried to shake the trunk of a palm tree? It doesn't shake. <laughs> like, you could be super strong and try to shake it, and even if you shook it a little bit, no fruit is really going to fall from it, right? Now, this is a woman who is in the throes of labor, about to give birth, and she's commanded, which means shake the trunk of the palm tree. Why? To strive, to take the action. The fruit is going to fall. The fruit is going to come to her. And she believes that. Because we know Sittina Maryam, when she was in the mihrab, and Sayyidina Zakaria would come to visit her, her guardian, he would see the fruits of summer in winter time. And he would see the fruits of winter in summertime. And he would ask her, where is this from? And she would say, هَذَا مِنْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ These provisions come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she already has that sakina, that tranquility, that belief that Allah is the best of all providers. But still, she takes the action. And that's what we have to have in our hearts when we seek forgiveness. The absolute unshakable belief that we will be forgiven. The belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all merciful. The belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants nothing more but to see us worshipping Him, worshipping the Creator. To believe that and know that in our hearts and yet to take all of the actions that prove that we are striving, that we have that sense of tawakkul. So what happens sometimes in our sincerity or in our seeking of, of forgiveness? There are two other terms that sound similar in Arabic as well that can be related in this area here. The word tashrif and taklif. Tashrif is the feeling that when you love someone very, very much, you will do anything 
to please that person because it's an honor to serve that person. It's an honor because you feel like you have so much love for that person. Taklif is when it becomes a burden. I'll give you an example. Um, let's say, I don't know who's popular. Oh, Zayn Malik has been in the news lately, right? So one <laughs> dia. <laughs> right, we, we have to bring him up. Like, you know, it's very timely, okay? So Zayn Malik. So how many young girls out there who are you know, obsessed with One Direction, you know, if, if they were told Zayn Malik is coming to town, would come straight, and, and you don't have to admit it if you might feel the same way, but like, it's completely understandable. Right? Would run out of their homes all excited, and you know, Zayn Malik might be like, uh, oh, you know, can you go get me a drink? Right? And some of those girls who are obsessed with One Direction and Zayn Malik, are they going to be like, no, get your own drink? No. No, they're like, oh, me, 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 I want to get the drink, right? They're going to go get the drink, right? And then if he says something like, oh, no, I spilled the drink, you know, on my shoe. The g girls who are absolutely in love with him would want to wipe the shoe for him, right? And then they come back and be like, I touched Zayn Medic's shoe. Like, you know, like, <laughs> OMG, right? Like, it would be amazing. That's tashrif. That's when you love someone so much that you want to do everything to serve that person, to make that person happy because you have that love. Okay? Taklif is when that love has been lost, when it becomes a burden. And this is something that we have to ask ourselves about as well. When we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we know that it's time for dhuhr, when we know that it's time for fajr, do we do it with a sense of tashrif or a sense of taklif? Are we eager to have that appointment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we eager to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all that we do? Or do we feel like, well, let me just pray dhuhr now to get it out of the way. Let me just finish you know, reading this just of Qur'an during Ramadan just because I'm supposed to do it. Just so that my mom tells me stop. You know, my mom stops telling me to go do it. You know? um, and, and that would be taklif. So that's when we really have to stop and again ask ourselves that sometimes when we question, will I get, be forgiven? How can I seek forgiveness? How can I even go down that path? We have to stop and ask ourselves, where are we in our self-forgiveness as well? We know Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salam, when he was, when he transgressed, when he decided to leave his community, he decided to, to, to stop giving da'wah before the commandment came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to leave the town. He just said, forget it, I give up on these people, they're not listening, you know, they're, they're never going to become Muslim, I'm going to leave. And as he left his town, right, and we know that after he left, the, the, the entire townspeople believed in Islam. They, they took the shahad and said, la ilaha illallah. But after he left, right, he was taken, you know, almost to awaken, right, to, to recognize what he had done. He was thrown from the boat, and he was in the bottom pit of darkness. He was swallowed by the whale. So he was in the darkest part possible, right, in the dunya, in the deepest part of the stomach's whale, in the deepest part of the ocean, all the way on the bottom of the ocean. So darkness upon darkness upon darkness. And it was in this darkness that again, Sayyidina Yunus did not sit and say, oh, woe is me, I can't believe this has happened to me, what poor misfortune. No, because we know Amr al-Muslim gharib, which means that the matter of a Muslim is strange. If something good befalls him, he says, alhamdulillah, this is something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If something bad, or what we perceive to be bad, befalls him, he also says, alhamdulillah, this is something good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that darkness, Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salam recited the, the dua, Subhanaka inni dhalamtu nafsi, Subhanaka inni kuntu min al Which means he recognized that he had transgressed against himself. And he had been of those who transgress. Because the transgression, when we skip our salah, when we commit a sin, when we um, start you know, messing around with that cute boy who sits next to us in math class, when we shouldn't be, right? It is not a transgression against anyone but ourselves. We are disobeying the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the, the pain of that transgression is a pain that resides within us. So it is ourselves that we are transgressing against. It is ourselves that we are truly the lumped. Um, the word the lumped is, is like blame. So it's as if you are putting self-blame upon yourself. Right? Because of course we know that with every raqa, every every prayer that we say, that is something that is for us, not something that is Allah. We need our salah. Our salah is a gift to us, not something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs. So we know that the waswasa of shaitan is something that consistently pulls us away from that seeking of forgiveness. It's that, that feeling that 
you know, I've done so much, I'll never be able to return. Or what difference does it make now? I've already gotten my belly button pierced. I've already gotten tattoos up and down the wazoo. I've already, you know, um, lost the, my virginity. I've already done this. I've already done that. It's too late. I can never, I, I'm not going to be forgiven. What difference does it make? These are the whisperings of shaitan. Because this is what shaitan wants. He wants us to believe that we are already so far gone, we'll never be forgiven. When we look at the fall of shaitan from Jannah, when we look at Iblis, when he committed a transgression, he disobeyed a commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was commanded, just as all the angels were commanded, to bow down to Adam. And out of arrogance, he said, I will not bow down to the, this creation because I am made of fire and he is made of clay. Now in that arrogance, in that not wanting to bow down, it was not just a sin of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it was also a sin of what we were saying before that ayah that we're told, لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله Do not despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that moment when he transgressed, he also despaired of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not seek forgiveness. He did not commit the sin and say, Oh truly, I have sinned. I have disobeyed you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have not followed your commandment. No. He made the choice not to seek forgiveness. And yet we see in that same time period, Sayyidina Adam salam, also disobeyed a commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He also transgressed against something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had commanded him. To, he ate from the fruit that he was forbidden to eat from. Yet look how different his fall was from the fall of shaitan. Look what happened to Sayyidina Adam. He was sent to earth with that belief, with that concept, with that mission to continue to worship the Creator and to continuously seek forgiveness. And in seeking that forgiveness, we know that Sayyidina Adam السلام, ends up in Jannah. Just as all of us who will sin, because we are created as human beings, and we will sin, none of us is immune to that sinning. None of us is immune to listening to the whispers of shaitan, because this is our struggle, this is our battle. And just as we may sin, the difference between the one who sins with arrogance and says, oh well, you know, I, I've already done it, there's nothing I can do, and refuses to bow down in humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, refuses to ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, is a huge difference as compared to the one who sins and repents and seeks Allah's forgiveness. And even if that one sins again, there is that process of repentance and sincerely seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you hear those whisperings of shaitan, when you hear that, that feeling within you that closes you up and says, tells you things such as, well, you know, I, I don't really think I should even wear um, hijab, for example, because I don't pray. So, you know, what difference does it make? It's not like, it's, it's just one more strike against me. Repeatedly say, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Know that these are the whisperings of shaitan pulling you further and further away from the deen rather than pushing you closer and closer to the deen. Another story that we know that has been narrated to us about the, the impact of arrogance and, and what it can do to us is the story of Barsis. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Barsis, uh, but he was a monk who was considered in his townspeople, and he was a monk at the time of monotheism, so after the time of Sayyidina Ibrahim, but prior to the time of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he was a, a monotheistic monk who was known in his town to be very, very good and very, very trustworthy. Okay? And he was he was humble, he would always try to humble himself and say, oh, you know, I, I, um, I am not as good as you may think, you know, you just think more highly of me than I really am. So there were two brothers who had a sister. So do you know the story of Barsis? <laughs> and the two brothers wanted to leave their sister in a safe place while they went off to fight in war. And so they approached Barsis and they said, you are the most trustworthy of all the people in this town. You are the one that we can leave our sister with. So initially Barsis questioned and hesitated and said, no, 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 I, you know, I don't want to have this responsibility. And then they, they flattered him and they said to him, and this is why they tell us flattery is the worst poison of the heart. Because flattery seeps in, in the form of making you think like, oh, this is nice, it's lovely to hear these words. And little by little it grows the ego and it grows that arrogance. And we know we're told that anyone who has an ounce of arrogance in their heart will not enter Jannah. So arrogance is, is the biggest of things that can lead you to shirk wa'arudhu billahi min shaitan So Initially, he said, no, 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 um, I don't want to. It's, it's too much of a responsibility. They told him, you're so trustworthy, you're so good, you're so kind. Who else could we leave her with? And so, you know, Shaitan started to whisper to him, you're right. You know, he started to say, um, 
I am kind. I am good. I am. Who else would you leave her with? Yeah. He said, okay, I'll take on the responsibility. And so he decided in the beginning to let the sister, who was a very beautiful young woman, stay in a house across from where his house was. And he said he wouldn't really interact with her. But little by little, he started to, to feel like, well, you know, she's all alone there. Maybe I should just take her meals for her. So initially, he would take her meals and he would leave them on the doorstep. And then Shaitan came to him again and said, well, she's all alone. You're going to leave her to eat alone? So he said, well, let me enter the home and at least eat with her. So he began to enter the home and eat with her. And little by little, that led to more comfort until the point where he actually committed zina with her. After he committed zina with her, she was with child. She was carrying a child. And Shaitan came to him again and said, oh, your reputation, what are people going to say? They're going to be so angry at you and the brothers. And how could you let this happen? You have to kill her. And you have to kill the child. So when the, the child was born, he killed the child and he killed the woman. And at this point, he didn't know what to do, so he buried the mother and the child under the floorboards of the house. When the brothers came back, so right now he committed zina, he committed murder, and he's also going to lie. So when their brothers came back and they asked him, you know, where is our sister, what happened uh, to her? He lied and said, oh, she died of an illness and she's buried over there. And he made a fake grave for her. Okay. So the brothers were so struck with grief, so they went home and you know, they were very upset. And in their dream, they, they saw that the woman was not really buried under there, but she was buried under the floorboards of her home. And so they went back the next day, and they dug up the grave, and they found that it was a fake grave. So they went into the home, and they dug up the floorboards, and they found the body of their sister and the baby, and they realized what must have happened. And so they went to Barsis, and they said, we will kill you, we will shame you, we will tell the entire town what you have done. And again, it wasn't even the killing that Barsis was afraid of, it was the loss of reputation. It was the idea that everyone in the town would no longer think he was that good person, that trustworthy person that he wanted to kind of display. And so he did not know what to do. So Shaitan came to him again and said, if you bow down to me, I will be sure to help you and I'll get you out of this mess. And so this monk, this monotheistic individual who all his life he had spent it in ibadah, in that moment of weakness, he bowed down to Shaitan and he committed the sin that is unforgivable, the sin of shirk. And then of course, as soon as he bowed down to him, Shaitan said, you're on your own. Okay, I've got, I can't help you out now, you know, you're done. And so he ended up in the hellfire. And this is what, what we've come to learn about arrogance, that if we within ourselves have come to a place of arrogance, it becomes hard not only to see, seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also to ask forgiveness from ourselves and from others. Because we've all been in that situation where we've said something to a friend, or a friend has misunderstood it or misinterpreted it, or, or you know, I'll take it even a little further. So in, in my line of work, what we do in the marriage center, we see a lot of difficulties between husband and, husbands and wives. Um, and a lot of times, these difficulties stem from places of misunderstandings, but also from places of arrogance. Okay? So arguments that might stem from, you said this to my mom, and I said this to your mom, and you don't like my sister, and I don't like your sister, and you know, those family things. And those are ones that maybe we can work through. But I would say about 90% of the couples who come to us come to us not because of those types of arguments, but because of situations of infidelity. So situations of cheating, situations of, um, whether it's, it's full on infidelity or um, simply emotional cheating. So getting too comfortable with someone in the workplace, uh, emailing, texting, um, I'm sorry, what is that? Yes, yes, in the Muslim Arab Center, yes. And it's unfortunate because we don't really talk about it in our communities, it's very, very hush hush. And this brings us to the next point, the, the point of sector that when someone commits a sin or a transgression, there has to be that element of setr, of covering, of not announcing the sins to everyone, not telling everyone, look what I did. Because that normalizes the sin sometimes. That sometimes makes other people think, well, look what um, Amina did. If Amina did that, what I'm doing is not half as bad. You know? So there has to be that element of setr as well, the covering. Right? But in situations of infidelity, um, counseling is important, but because in our community we take the sense of satr not so much because it is a, a, a covering from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but because of the shame it might cause in the community. Again, in al-a'malu bin niyat in actions are but by intentions. A lot of times in our community the intention of not talking about certain problems in the community is not satr 
but more because of, of the shaming of the losing of the um, respect of the community. Similar to Barthes, a place that, of arrogance, kind of. What would they say about me if they knew that my husband did X, Y, Z? What would they say about me if they knew that my wife did this? this? And that, unfortunately, causes a lot of people to not seek help, to not try to seek out that, those avenues that can help them. You know, there's a, a narration on the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he, he was approached by a man who said to him, I was walking uh, and I passed by a garden, and in the garden I saw a beautiful woman. I was so taken by this beautiful woman that I entered the garden and I did unspeakable things with her. I did everything with her except zina. So I stopped at, at the point of zina, but I did everything else that is terrible with her. Can I repent? Can I seek forgiveness? Now he said this to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a large gathering. So there were several Sahaba around the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the Sahaba got upset and they said, how could you speak of these things? Go, what happened to the satr? You know, there has to be satr here. You shouldn't uncover your sins to the public. Okay? And then the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stopped them. And he told the man that satr is important, but you came seeking advice. You came seeking help. When the Sahaba pushed him away and said, stop, don't advertise, you know, they almost pushed him to the point of saying, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to be forgiven. Almost pushed him to the point of thinking, well, I've done something so terrible, I shouldn't even talk about it. I, how am I ever going to seek forgiveness? And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stopped him and he said, pray, seek forgiveness in your prayer. And from this there will come the satr. So there has to be a, a way that we understand as well that when we do commit a sin, if we feel like we need help because we need to speak to someone about it, I'm not saying go talk to you know your next door neighbor or um, Joe from calculus class. Okay, <laughs> I don't know why calculus class keeps factoring in today, but you know, um, no, but find someone who can help you, who can work through it while still understanding that that element of stuff will be there. So I was talking about. Uh, about finding that, oh, so forgiveness, that's what I was saying. So in the married couples, one of the hardest things, I would say, for couples to get past is that situation of infidelity. And yet, it's also one of the most common transgressions that we are seeing in married couples today. And as I said, it's not always full-on infidelity where it's an entire physical affair that has happened. It's a lot of emotional infidelity as well. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we have cell phones, we have laptops, we have iPads, we have so many ways to communicate with other people but we're not communicating with the people that matter the most, with our families, with our spouses, with the people that we really care about the most. And, you know, whenever I, I give my marriage seminars, I'll usually have uh, the, the men and the women send a text message to their spouse saying how they feel about them, you know, um, that they love them, that their eyes are beautiful, that, you know, something out of the ordinary. And usually what will happen is right after the message is sent, like the, the men's, and if it's like a separate sister seminar or the men are separate than the women, the men's phone will all start ringing and they'll answer and they'll be like, no, I swear I didn't do anything, you know? And the women's phone will start ringing and they'll be like, no, I didn't buy anything, you know? Because it's so, they're so not used to sharing those terms of endearment with one another, right? And when we have that absence of kindness or mawadda or rahma towards the spouse, a lot of times it becomes easy to share that type of emotional connection with someone who you're not married to. And it becomes very tempting to do that. And we know that one of Shaitan's greatest um, wishes is to break the family apart. We're told that he sits on his arsh, on his throne um, in Jahannam, and his, I guess, minions, or yes, the <laughs> surround him. And each will come and will say, today I made so-and-so steal. And he'll say, you have done nothing. And today I have made so-and-so murder. And he'll say, you have done nothing. And today I have made so-and-so this. And he'll say, you have done nothing. Until the one comes to him and says, today I have broken apart a family. Today I have caused a husband and wife to argue and to cause strife between them. And Shaitan responds and says, today you have done well. Okay? Because breaking up that marriage, breaking up that, that family structure is one of the fastest ways to break the, the goodness within community, to break the morality within community. And we see that today, we see it unraveling so, so quickly. But I'm, I'm kind of trans, uh, you know, moving in a different, uh, um, digressing a little bit here. So I'm gonna go back to the topic at hand. Um, so again, as these couples are struggling to reconcile what happened, there are stages of forgiveness, even in that. And, and when I think of forgiveness, this topic always comes to mind, probably because I deal with it on a daily basis, but also because it may be one of the most difficult situations where a person feels such an intense amount of betrayal when they're the victim in this type of situation. A betrayal of trust, a betrayal of that physical connection, that emotional connection, um, just a, a feeling that how could you? 
And we see this across, you know, not only in Islam, across faith, you know, any faith that anyone adheres to, and even not only in marriages. I mean, when people are still just dating or, you know, girlfriend and boyfriend, they're taken aback by, you know, cheating. That's the worst thing that could happen in this relationship. So the process that we go through, even in, in counseling in these situations, is the three steps of forgiveness, basically. The first form of forgiveness that must be sought is the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there is no moving past this crisis in a marriage, and truly it is a crisis in a marriage because it affects the couple in profound ways. But there's no moving past this crisis in the marriage without first seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that seeking that forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually has to come from both sides. And this is sometimes very like shocking news to the person who feels like they, they're the victim in this situation. But the reality is that when the situation is uncovered, oftentimes a person who is the victim will react in very harsh ways, will become angry, will, be, will say things maybe that are hurtful, will um, you know, uh, throw out accusations, and oftentimes you can't move past that without first seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your actions, regardless if you were the one who transgressed, who committed the actual sin, or you were the one who was on kind of the receiving end of hearing about it and learning about it. After really committing to seeking that forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, really repenting, and that's one of our first requirements that, you know, you come ready with that intention that this was something that happened, it's done, I want the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I also want to get forgiveness from my spouse. After that forgiveness comes the next level of forgiveness, which is, and, and that's, we always tell our couples who come to us, that's a guaranteed forgiveness, that the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. His rahmah is there, his mercy is there. The forgiveness of the human being is much harder to attain, you know. But again, if you have oppressed someone, if you have committed a wrong against someone, then you must seek their forgiveness before and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will soften their heart to forgive you before that that day that you are questioned on the day of judgment. So the next step is the forgiveness from the individual themselves, that really correcting those wrongs, seeking that forgiveness in a way where you can um, connect with that person and a lot of times explain to that person that it really wasn't about them. This really was a very personal level, of a, a personal situation that it wasn't that they weren't pretty enough, it wasn't that they weren't making enough money, it wasn't that they didn't appeal to you anymore, but that a lot of times it comes from a different place of insecurity. And the third level of forgiveness which I believe is the hardest of all forgivenesses, is the forgiveness of self. Because we are really, really, really hard on ourselves. Right? So many times we look at ourselves and we think that we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we're not strong enough, we're not pretty enough, we just can't do it anymore, we can't handle things anymore. And a lot of times when couples, when, when the victim in the situation goes through a breakdown or when the person who actually committed the sin also um, has a bit of a, an emotional breakdown, it's because they're struggling to forgive themselves as well. It's hard for them to get past that and to get to that safe point where they can look back and be like, I did something that was wrong or I committed an action or an action was committed against me. That doesn't define me as a person. It doesn't define who I am. So really seeking that, that forgiveness of the self as well, recognizing that we all make mistakes, we all commit things that we shouldn't be doing, um, but there's always that open door of forgiveness. Um, and I think I just want to wrap up with one last uh, narration that I want to share with you. Um, it occurred during the time of uh, Umar ibn Khattab when he was the Khalifa. Um, there was a, uh, a boy who was brought to him by these two older gentlemen and they said, this boy has killed our father and we need to seek justice. You know, we can't forgive him, he killed our father. And so Umar ibn Khattab turned to the boy and said, is this true, did you kill the father? And so the boy said, I did, but it was by mistake. I didn't do it on purpose. And so he said, explain what the situation was. So he said, well, I had with me my camel. And because the camel went onto their land, the, the, the brothers and the father began to throw rocks at the camel. So one of the rocks that the father threw blinded my camel. And the camel is the only possession that I have. I felt very attached to my camel. So out of anger, I took a rock and threw it at the father, and it killed the father. So Umar ibn al-Khattab turned to uh, the, the two brothers and said, will you forgive the boy for what he's done? And so the brothers were very angry and they said, no, we must you know, have revenge for the death of our father. And so the, the, the boy said, okay, you know, I will essentially at that time revenge, what they meant was they wanted to kill the boy in return for their father being dead. So the boy said, give me three days. I have a, a younger brother who I take care of, and I have saved some amount of money from when my parents passed away to give to my younger brother. Let me go gather that, that money, let me make sure my brother's taken care of, and in three days' time, I will be back here. 
So the brother said, we need a guarantor, someone who will guarantee that if this boy does not come back, they will stand in the place of the boy. So everyone was quiet. It was a packed room. And Umar ibn Khattab looked around and said, will anyone be the one who is the guarantor for this boy? And nobody stood up. And so after some time had passed, Abu Dhar who was one of the very well-known um, fighters of Islam, one of the, the true uh, initial people who gave their heart and their wealth and everything for Islam. So Abu Dhar stood up and he said, I will be the one who is the guarantor for him. So Umar ibn Khattab said, go, you have three days. So Two days passed, you know, no sign of the boy. Everyone in the town said, oh no, the boy has run. He's not going to come back. Um, what's going to happen now? By the third day, at Asr time, the two brothers came to Abu Dhar's house and they said, it's time. You know, it's the third day. The boy hasn't come. You have to come back with us to the courthouse to see uh, Umar. And um, the Abu Dhar hesitated for a little bit and he said, but it is not Maghrib time yet. The day is not time done until Maghrib. So I will go with you, but we'll wait until Maghrib time. So they, he went with them to the courthouse. And in the courthouse, they waited, they waited, and there was no sign of the boy. A few minutes before Maghrib, the boy came running in. And so the townspeople all, the boy, all were shocked. They said, oh, what's going to happen now? The boy came back. Nobody expected that the boy would really come back. The boy came back, and what's going to happen? So Umar ibn Khattab was surprised that the boy came back. And he asked the boy, he said, why would you come back? You had the opportunity to run away and for nobody to hear from you again, and that would be it. So the boy said, I never want it to be said that a Muslim made a promise and didn't keep his word. And so then the townspeople turned to Abu Dhar and they said, and Sayyidina Umar turned to Abu Dhar and he said, why would you be the guarantor for this boy? You don't even know this boy. What made you stand up and be the guarantor? And so Abu Dhar responded and said, I never want the day to come where it is said that a Muslim was in need and that another Muslim did not come to his aid. And so in the town, everybody was kind of humbled by what Abu Dhar and the boy said. And so Umar turned to um, the two brothers and said, what do you have to say for this? And so the two brothers looked at the boy and Abu Dhar and they said, we forgive them. Never do we want it to be said that a Muslim asked for forgiveness from another Muslim and was not forgiven. So I think that's something that we all have to keep in mind, that we are our own worst enemies sometimes. We are our own harshest critics, and we are sometimes the one that stands in the way of allowing others to seek that forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we lead them to believe that they're not worthy of forgiveness. So um, I hope that you were able to learn something that from what I shared. If I have said anything good, please know it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I said anything bad or wrong or incorrect, please know that it is from myself or from Shaytan. Jazakum Allah.